Welcome to Promote Profit Publish. I'm your host, Juliette Clark, and we have another great guest today. I know I always say that, you know, guys, I, you, I do, but you really have to tune in for this one. I'm going to tell you why in a minute. So I want to remind you before we get started to go over and take the Promote Profit Publish quiz. You can find that at promoteprofitpublishquiz.com and go over and subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can see today's guest who looks just like Angie Harmon. So see, now you're going to go over to YouTube. Now you have to go over to YouTube. So today's guest is Melanie Hershorn. I hope I said that right. You and did. she is a digital content creator and a coach on a mission to empower female entrepreneurs by helping them conquer their digital marketing challenges and giving them more time to focus on what they do best. We're going to talk about a little about why she is going to give you guys time this year too, because she's had sort of a challenging year. Through her company, VIP Digital Content, Melanie helps her clients attract their ideal clients, nurture leads, and position themselves as an authority in their field. She has an extensive knowledge about starting a business from scratch, curating the best digital content for any niche, and she has the writing skills necessary to help businesses grow. A truly takes a village to do this. And she knows this because she is a, well, she, it says she's a former small business owner herself, but I think she actually owns a business now. So she's still a small business owner. Uh, she has worked in print, radio, and as a TV journalist and as a PR specialist in Hollywood. Melanie has won numerous journalism awards and received her master's degree in broadcast journalism at the University of Southern California. She also loves to provide marketing tips in her private Private Facebook group, VIP Digital Marketing. I'm sorry, VIP Digital Marketing Tips. I need my journalism taken back today. I can't speak and there's no editor. So welcome, Melanie. Hi, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me on. Well, excited to have you. I didn't know you went to USC, like right down the street from where I used to live. Yeah, yeah. I uh, Oh, you live down there, huh? Oh, well, well, not down <laughs> there, but oh, yes, good. Okay. I guess I no. I lived in Manhattan Beach, so it wasn't. Oh, that's it was way better. It, yeah, it was, no, I didn't live in like the hood that's next to. USA. That's what I thought you meant, and I was like, <laughs> no, no. Oh, no. sorry if I just insulted the hood down there. So. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're gentrifying or whatever, who knows? So, yeah. So yeah, I went there. I mean, that was a long time ago already, but, uh, now, now I'm living in Phoenix and, uh, you know, just a hop, skip and a jump from LA. That's awesome. So you've had a bit of a challenging year, which I think has, um, actually helped you help more women because of COVID you have been homeschooling at the same time. Is that right? Oh yes. Yes, I have. <laughs> It has been challenging because I was not put on this earth to teach children. <laughs> Adults, yes. Children, no. <laughs> that is so funny because I can't even imagine. I have this thing, you know, like when you took your, I don't know if you did, but when I took my kids to daycare for the first time and they just cried and then you, you oh, feel yeah. so bad and you call it and they're like, oh yeah, they quit crying the minute you walked out the door. Um, I just imagine that, you know, everybody else thinks your children are so wonderful. Um, they're so well behaved at other people's house and in your own house, they're just awful sometimes. So oh, yeah. I can't, I can't even imagine homeschooling my, my kids. Oh yeah. And, and, you know, you throw the computer into the whole mix and it just makes it even more complicated because kids don't want to sit in front of a screen for hours on end while somebody talks at them. Right. I, if it's a video game, if it's a way to gamify it, they'd probably be into it. But I know. Yeah. Hit the space bar every time the teacher says yes. Something. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So let's jump into some digital marketing. Um, COVID hit. And now all of a sudden being online, marketing online, all of that is more important than ever. What changes have you seen since all of this came into being? Well, it started with all of a sudden, everybody was an online coach and I thought, okay, well, we're going to have to separate out the, what do they say? The, the wheat from the chaff. And, and I feel that at this point in time, those who are still online really have content that is providing value. So the shifts have been 
anybody who wasn't online or they were thinking about it, they realized this is it. This is all I have because people are not going to come into my, you know, brick and mortar, whatever at this point. Yeah, that is so true. And it seems like, I, I know what you're saying, like everybody all of a sudden became a digital expert, whether they really had a good platform or not. But the other side of that is all of the people who came in and said, okay, I don't have one. Can you get me one up in 30 days? Not realizing that this is a taught, like there's trial and error there, are, you know, there's all this going on. So um, have, did you experience that as well? Well, I mean, for myself, I was already online. So that was a plus. And then, yeah, I had an influx of clients who all of a sudden realized that they needed digital content and that they didn't have the bandwidth to do it themselves. Or did they, did they, they didn't even want to try, but they knew that they needed it. So yeah, I mean, absolutely. And then of course, you know, things get weeded out and you can see where some people have longevity and others, you know, it wasn't going to happen for them, even in COVID times. Yeah, that, that is really true. I think it's really separated. Um, someone came in last week and, and was, she, she's branding herself as a speaker. And it was interesting because I was like, so where are you going to speak? <laughs> like, <laughs> what stages do you have booked? Because she said, you know, my psychology business is not doing that well. So now I'm going to be a speaker. I don't know. Well, what, what do you think of that career move? <laughs> well, I mean, if you want to go in on virtual summits every single day, then that would be a great way to build up your, I guess, your, your portfolio of speaking. But um, I would say if you're, if you have a business, then see if you can move that business itself online. Um, I, you know, I remember talking to a therapist once and I, it's kind of a convoluted story, but I, uh, the therapist was for my a family member and the family member was coming in from out of town and I wanted the family member to see the therapist. Would the therapist be able to do Zoom? This was, you know, pre-COVID when this was not something that everybody was doing. And the therapist said to me, oh no, I don't do online. And I thought, Hmm. Okay. Well, that's too bad because you're really missing out on, on, you know, uh, uh, all these people that could be serviced by you, but don't happen to live in your city. And I mean, now I bet she's online because when you have a business, if you can move it online, you absolutely should. Yeah, I agree. And I think there are a lot of people who are going to find that online is going to eliminate a lot of overhead because you can get rid of your offices, you can get rid of, you know, the, the phone line, you can use your cell phone. But I think the biggest thing I see are the people who, like the therapists, and we don't have to talk just about therapists, but people in general who were throwing, they were doing workshops, live workshops, and now they're kind of in this space where, how am I going to get clients and how am I going to do that workshop online in an engaging way? So there's a lot going on in that sense that wasn't going before. Absolutely. But you know what? All the clients are online. Yeah. They're absolutely online now. So it's really a question of creating content that's going to attract them to you and what it is that you offer. So talk a little bit, bit about that. Um, why content? Because I, I, when I mention it, people have so much resistance. It's too hard. It takes too much time. It, you know, every excuse you can see in the book. Well, sure. It is time consuming, especially if you're not, if it's not your zone of genius and, you know, you're an engineer and you're trying to bang out 10 blog posts. I mean, it's not your zone of genius. You're building things and not writing things necessarily. But I, I think that, you know, content truly is the first touch point when somebody is researching and they come across you and your company. If you have something online that is some form of content, whether it's what you're posting on Instagram or it's your LinkedIn page or it's a blog post that you wrote or an article that you published on Medium or whatever, that's the first, that's their foray into getting to know you. And if you don't have content, then how are people going to find you? You're not there, so to speak. 
Yeah, that is so true. So then comes up the next problem. So now I'm out there and I'm creating content. I need a funnel because uh, people are opening emails again. Email uh, marketing is becoming more of a thing. It really went out of vogue for quite a while there. So talk about why that's uh, more important than ever and, and doing it right, not just like sales pitches. <sighs> Yeah. Okay. So I'll start from the beginning here. Okay. So email is more important than ever because if you want something to, if you want your subscribers to see something instantaneously, then you need to put it in an email and send it to them. Because if you post it on Instagram, they may see it three days later. They may never see it at all based on the algorithm. Also, if you do not have email subscribers and you only rely on the people who follow you on social media, mm. you have no way of reaching them if and when that social media goes bye-bye. Periscope is gone now. Officially. Thank officially. God. I read that. I read that officially. <laughs> I remember several years ago being on Periscope and thinking, whoa, I'm broadcasting to people. This is so <sighs> weird. And, you know, now I go live on Facebook almost daily. But uh, back in those days, in the, you know, 2013, 2014, 2015, whenever that was, go, you know, so it, it changes. Things change. Email addresses don't change that often. And you know that if you have a flash sale and you send an email out, whoever's going to open that email is going to know about it right away. So that's why your subject line is the most important part of your email. You know, that's really true too. And I want to just go back to that social media for a minute. We are seeing, and, and of course we're recording this in December. So by the time it records, hopefully it'll change a little bit. We're seeing so much censorship on social media. So many people are literally jumping off. I know I jumped off before the 2020 election. I was just off Facebook. I was done with it, even though I had a huge following. Um, there's an important lesson in there about transitioning your people from social media into your email list. And one of my friends, do you remember MySpace? Are you? Tom was my first <laughs> friend on MySpace. Tom was everybody's first I friend. Know. <laughs> um, one of my friends had a, a really glossy, great magazine and over 300,000 clicks a month but she never had a CTA and when P and she had sponsors, she was making her money from sponsorships. When uh, Facebook became the new MySpace and everybody jumped off, she had no way to bring those people over to Facebook with her. So there's a good reason right there why you need that email list and why you need to nurture it as well. You need to transition those people off of social media and into your list because nobody can take your list. Absolutely. Nobody can take your list. And I'll give you another example of, um, I have a friend who is a, um, an influencer and she's got hundreds of thousands of followers on Instagram, but maybe a fraction of that in terms of emails. And oh. if the algorithm doesn't go your way or Instagram shuts down your account, then you're not going to have another way to reach these people. So that is why, and I could say this all day and all night long, Having a freebie, an opt-in, a quiz, something that gets people to want the, the some, something of value that you have to give them for free in exchange for their email address, that is your meal ticket right there. Yeah, very, very much so. So um, I know you mentioned the, uh, the headline, the title of the email already. What else makes an effective email? A call to action. I mean, I could take you through the whole, <laughs> I could take you through the whole thing, but um, ideally you want to have a very good subject line that entices somebody to open it. Mm -hmm. And then telling a story in an email is always a great idea because stories are how humans learn and we remember and things resonate with us. You want to hit those pain points, you want to offer a solution, and then you always want a call to action. So you never want to just say, okay, bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. No, that is not going to help you. You always want to be leading people to the next thing, whether it's to join your Facebook community 
or to hop on a discovery call with you. Uh -huh. I always want to lead people to the next thing. That, you know what, that's so true. And owning a publishing company, I have to tell you, um, when we run bestseller campaigns and, and different kinds of campaigns for people, um, the, book, the book people are always like, well, what do you mean what's next? They're going to buy my book. <laughs> what's next? Because that book is not going to allow you to retire to the island next to Richard Branson, but your programs and services will. So there's that, the really important part of that CTA is what's next, what's next, what's next, always on every always. email. Absolutely. And your book is your leverage, right? So you can think of your email as that as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely true. So what do you see out there that, that people do? What, what are the big mistakes people make on those emails? <laughs> well, <laughs> there are that many. It's only a 30 minute show. Come on now. <laughs> yeah, no. I don't. <laughs> well, uh, let me, let me draw attention to the, first of all, let's talk about mistakes. It's okay to make a mistake, right? So often we get paralyzed by the fear of, of, of creating an email that people are going to judge us on that we don't do it at all. So let me first say it's better to make a mistake than to not send an email at all. But that, and you know, how often do you get an oops, we sent the wrong link email mm -hmm. from a company or oops, our whole site was down or oops, you got invited to something that you're not really invited to. <laughs> so <laughs> that's okay. It happens and everybody understands. So the mistakes in emails are not having a call to action or having a pretty terrible call to action, like click here. Nobody's going to click. In your call to action, you wanna promise them the success that they're going to have by taking the action. So for example, if it's join my Facebook group, you know, come and be part of a community of like-minded women business owners. That's what they're going to get. That's interesting. So that also means that your messaging better be pretty clear when you do, when you put the, together these calls to action, because that's what I see a lot is really muddled messages. Absolutely. And it starts with knowing exactly who your ideal client is. Because if you are speaking to everybody in the world, you are speaking to nobody. Um, I've had, you know, calls with people where I've said, well, who's your ideal client? And they said, everyone with skin. <laughs> and I said, that's not possible because are you, you know, are you selling a product to a 90 year old man? or a four-year-old girl. I mean, they don't have the same issues. So who are you selling this to? And so that's a really important, your messaging is everything really. It is, but that brings us sort of to the conversion piece of this. So one of my book people brought me a website earlier this week and she said, I want a website like this. And I took a look at the three pages and I said, I can guarantee you there's no conversion going on here. None whatsoever. She's not selling a darn thing on this website. So it all has to have the conversion element. Can you explain that to, to our audience as well? It, you can't just have an opt-in and a free something, even though I want you to talk about the benefit of a free something, but it's the conversion that matters on this. Right. And a conversion doesn't mean dollars necessarily. It, whatever the conversion is, it's people are taking action. They're taking a step and they're joining your community in some way, shape, or form, whether that's they're on your email list, they are in your, they, they follow you on Instagram, wherever you're the most active. But to, to make sure that your message is telling them what they're going to get, you always want to be clear and concise and not confusing mm. because a confused mind right. says no. Exactly. But that's a good point though, because from a neuromarketing standpoint, you know, and I know you can tell, I can tell, I can always tell when you have created your own landing page because, and I, so can everybody else there. And they might not actually know why, because from a neuromarketing standpoint, you're, they're looking at color, message, proportion, your mind is taking on so much at one time. And when it walks away, it's not necessarily always your topic. Sometimes it's the aesthetics of what's being put in front of them. 
Absolutely. Which, yeah, which goes right back to conversion. So that's why, that's why you need professionals like Melanie to help you with all of this. Because I'm not kidding. Uh, can you tell when you go to somebody's landing page, can you tell when they did it themselves? Oh, for goodness sake. Yeah. I've, you know, and even I've had clients where I've watched, they say, okay, the landing page is done. And I look at it and I'm like, oh, okay. Well, how is it going? <laughs> because when some, and you know, and it's not anybody's fault necessarily. It's just that sometimes when you're so close to the product or the service or the situation, you can't see the forest for the trees. And you can't be objective and write about it in a way that is objective. That's what writers are there for. That's what we do. We create content knowing that we have to write it from the point of view of the would-be client or customer, not from the point of view of the person who's trying to sell the item or service. Let's talk about that for a minute. So guru marketing's over. Would you agree with that? Well, tell me, define guru marketing for me. Guru marketing, where it's all about the person. It's all about the influencer. We saw a lot of it a couple of years ago, well, like six figures in six months and look at my beautiful house and look at my beautiful wife and uh, all that instant gratification stuff. I think for the most part, that's over. I don't, I'm it, still seeing it though. I really am. It, I, was, I was wondering if that's what you meant. But yes, yeah. you're not seeing as many like, men splayed out on a Ferrari pictures <laughs> as you were before or women by the, the, you know, in the Maldives as you were before. You're not. But I also think that's a sign of the times because nobody's, nobody's doing anything in, in COVID at this point. Um, but I still think, you know, there are the names there's that name recognition still has clout. I do believe. Yeah, but I, I think there has become this realization, though, that some of the gurus had big names but didn't provide really great services. They were great marketers, but not so much great servicers. So I think we're seeing a real shift now into the how can I help you mode instead of the all about me, I'm so awesome mode. <laughs> it, right. But I, I could never ascribe to that anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't know. On the Enneagram thing, I'm like a three, two, which I don't know how that goes together, but it means that I really like to be, you know, the center of attention, but I also really like to serve. Mm -hmm. So I could never make it about me because it's about the writing. It's about the message. Right. And, and so that's, I think all business owners should think about that whenever they sit down to create any message for their business. Remember that you're, it's not about you. It's about the person buying it from you and how you and your, or your product or your service are going to benefit their lives. So I think what Melanie just told you was the results you get, because I always have to tell people, nobody cares about your process. Nope. No, nobody cares if you sprinkle flowers on them while you're doing it. It's whether they're going to get results or not. So right. What's that's the a success. Yeah, they're really good points on that. So where can we find you if we want to find more about what you do? And do you have any, anything coming up soon that you can share? Um, I always have things coming up. Um, I also have this fantastic content quiz where you can figure out if your content is working for you. And that's at mycontentquiz.com. And I also do a ton of stuff in my Facebook group, which um, you can actually get to by going to vipdigital.live slash community. Very, very good. Well, thank you for sharing some of these uh, tips today and, and why we need content, because I think, I think a lot of people are struggling without it. I agree. Thank you so much for this opportunity, Juliet. You're welcome.